Hello, everyone, and welcome to another weekly coaching conversation with GoMobi.Work, where every week we are bringing you a topic in employee performance development, human capital management, and team leadership that you can bring back to your team to help create the lasting transformation that it takes to be very successful and create an enduring legacy. So we are joined here today by a very special guest who I will get to introduce in a moment. Uh, Jeff is going to be a really great resource for all of you. Thank you for tuning into this. Um, if there are people who are trickling in live, we will admit you as you as you are needed. And if you are watching this after the fact, uh, leave us a comment. We want to know what you thought of this this resource. And as always, tell us how this is helping you work with your team. We really we really hope that you're taking the lessons in here and applying them. So. Uh, my name is Wade Bruffy. I'm the co-founder of GoMobi.Work, and I am joined by my other co-founder here, Mr. Zoltan Sarda. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to have you all join us and really looking forward to this conversation with Jeff. We um, have had a couple of conversations uh, previously. Uh, it's always great to be um, in the same space with somebody with whom we're really aligned, but also with uh, different ideas that really push your thinking. So I'm uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yes. And everyone, we are absolutely honored to introduce you to Mr. Jeff Eichler also. Jeff, thank you for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to it, guys. Great way to spend a Friday afternoon. Yes, indeed. That is what we think also. So, uh, Jeff, we got introduced through a mutual friend of ours, somebody who I, we, we both have a lot of respect for, um, Jen Young. And Jen is a intuitive uh, intuitive mastermind coach and she does a lot of work with a bunch of different types of business but we'd love to know um how you got introduced to her and what were some of the things the concepts that kind of brought you together and what what made what made that such a good fit uh that's a that's a good question um i think it's it's the whole connection between intuitive and leadership it's it's not something that we see, or at least that I saw, and I've been studying leadership for 40 some years. It's not something that I see regularly. And, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, leaders are supposed to base actions on, you know, on research, on talking with other people. It's a lot of it is externally focused. And what Jen talks about is relying internally that you have some of these answers and uh, you may have that little voice in your head saying, oh, no, you've got to talk to people on the outside to get the real truth. You know, don't trust yourself. And what Jen is all about is saying, no, focus on yourself. Go with go with some gut, go with some in intuition. And I, I loved that. It was really refreshing. Um, it doesn't it doesn't mean that you become uh, cocky or anything like I have all the answers, because what I loved about it when, when Jen and I talked is she's very big on this idea of reflection, not just shooting from the hip leadership, but actually sitting, pausing and reflecting and, and weighing lots of things and then going with what your gut is saying. Yeah, I love that. And I, I think you, you touch on the, the not becoming cocky piece is another thing that I love. And I'd love to have a little bit of a discussion about that now. Because I feel like um, it's really great. We need to be in tune with uh, our reactions to things and how we look about the world. And to be able to make a really great decision, there has to be all kinds of factors involved. And especially like that factor of just knowing when you just feel like something is the right thing to do, how to know when that's happening and how to act on it wisely. I think right. that's the that's the thing that I respect the most about Jen's work um, is that she's so good at, at at helping people understand what is that uh, when I how to recognize when you're feeling that way and then what to do about it. Yeah, what this works uh, or it runs up against though is this feeling I think on a lot of leaders' parts, and I've seen this. I saw this when I was in schools, when I've worked with educators, and when I was in business, and. I was in the business of education. I worked in educational publishing for 40 some years. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was a lot, of, a lot of leaders thinking, I have to have all the ideas because mm -hmm. people expect leaders to have all the ideas. And what they were doing was, was shutting out information streams 
a big one from their people thinking if I go out and solicit ideas from from the troops or whatever, I'm going to look weak and I don't want to look weak in front of people. So Jen's not arguing here to have all the answers. She's definitely saying, do your do your research, your homework, get opinions from other people, but then sit with yourself and 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 think it through. So I really I really like that. I found it very refreshing. And I think this goes to that piece. I mean, it, it's so interesting to me that how companies really spend huge amounts of time and resources on finding the exact right people to hire. And then we often don't have the structures that actually capitalize on their knowledge, you know, and or, or even make it apparent to employees that's like, I can I can throw in an idea here. This is one of the um, pieces that we've talked about in terms of employee development is really thinking about it as building off the assets and knowledge that we hired those people for. Uh, and maybe it's their professional experience, maybe it's background experience, maybe it's ways of thinking. Um, but really, how do we how do we release that, as you said, that ownership of the knowledge and skill and bring it out in the people because it's already there? Yeah, and and just to add to that, Zoltan, I think companies do spend a lot of time trying to hire the right people. Yeah. I don't think they turn over all the stones. And one one of the big areas, one of the 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 big shifts that needs to happen when you're hiring people is to get into the area. I'll just call it what it is. For me, it's emotional intelligence. You know, how well do you know yourself? How well do you manage yourself? How well do you know others and how well do you interact with others? And a lot of times in the interviewing process, you're being you're being interviewed for your technical skills, the results that you got at a former company. But uh, and, and I, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here, but I think this is a weakness on, on the part of a lot of hiring managers is that they're not looking at how this person is going to support the culture of the organization. It's going to be an integral part of the culture. And that to me, when I work with organizations in a consulting capacity, they're, yeah, they're going to have problems with um, supply chain, but their big problems are often with people, right? That people can't get along. And, and you know, everybody's going after solidifying their own territory and they're building up these, these silos. And some of that has to be brought out, I think, in, in a more rigorous interviewing process. Yeah, some of the biggest challenges that I've experienced being part of organizations and working with with others of varying sizes are those personnel challenges, and they can really set back a company years, in my experience. I mean, it's really a challenging thing. Yeah. I, I uh, well, I'd be really interested in um, that hiring process. Your some of your thoughts on strategies or techniques for. Un- Covering those emotional intelligence pieces that we're looking for, but I also think um, folks that are doing this kind of piece is that there's also we don't think of emotional intelligence development as static. It's like people can grow in, in that area in organizations. Um, so that idea of like, how do you think about it? from the hiring process, what are you looking for and how do you get at that? But then also thinking in the, the development process, how are we building that in people? Yeah. So, okay. So uh, two parts, A and B there. Great, great yeah. setup. Um, one, one of the, one of the challenges that organizations have, and I saw this in education all the time is that we're, we're hiring people who generally were in the classroom and now we're expecting them to be administrators, right? They were used to being in the classroom. They were used to doing a certain thing. And without any kind of training, they're being asked to make a, a, a major shift to become a school administrator. And a lot of their attention is now focused on mechanics as, a fo- as opposed to focusing on people. So that's that's one of the issues. The 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 question that you asked the Zoltan, what what I work with uh, people on, um, especially people who are looking for jobs, I say, don't go into a job interview unless you have three or four very detailed stories in your back pocket. And when you're asked a question, and sometimes a, a, a keen interviewer will say, tell me a story. Tell me a story about something that 
you you did in the organizations, how you got results. And what I'm listening for are how often do they talk about the people that supported th that person? Or is it all about them? Mm -hmm. Are they are they talking about the team that they assembled, the team that they led? And um, I read I read an amazing book a few years ago uh, by Dr. Alan Stern. Alan Stern was the uh, and and still is the the project lead on um, the New Horizons mission to Pluto. And oh, cool. the, and uh, uh, you talk about being honored to talk to somebody. He I mean he was just this was a uh, a three billion mile journey over, I think it was nine years. And all he talked about was his team. And it was it was amazing. And I also, on, on the podcast, I'll just tell this as an aside and then I'll get back to the, the story. I interviewed the team leader who um, built the spacecraft that was intended to directly hit the asteroid so that we could prove that we have the capability of hitting an asteroid and moving it out of its position should it become dangerous to Earth. All she talked about was her team and about hiring the right people. So if you're interviewing people in a, you know, in a, a, a job hiring uh, situation, my advice would be to pose that question. Tell me a story about something that you did that you're proud of the accomplishments and or something that didn't go well, because mm -hmm. are you just talking about the failures of other people or are you accepting responsibility for yourself? And also watch for body language. If you're able to, if you're in a, in a setting, how comfortable are they? Are they, are they uh, animated as they're talking? A lot of times, you know, we know that a lot of communication comes from um, verbal it, it does or audible or visual it doesn't it's not necessarily the words it's how people are 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 responding so i would i would definitely say get people talking have them talk about a story that that um that they're proud of or something that could have uh gone better at work and and listen for what you think is important which is the the people part of it that's what i would argue and I've had that experience where you're, you know, interviewing somebody, you've got sort of the, the questions and they're, they're often nervous or, you know, fidgety or uptight. And then once they tell the story, it's like, there's the real person. Exactly. Uh, the exactly. story really brings that out in them. So. Right. And how quickly can they tell the story? Right. Because that, that tells you something right there. You know, one, they, they prepped well, but they're, they're proud of that or yeah. it, it had an impact. Yeah, I was going to say it's very, very forward and informative in their in their experience. If they're able to talk about it, if we're able to communicate that. I always find like when we're uh, speaking about something with a client or with with a customer of ours or in some kind of situation, it's those things when the conversation just prompts it and then you just boom, like super quickly transition. You're like the light bulb goes on. And you're just enthusiastically speaking about something and you're talking fast and you're talking loud and you're excited. That's when, you know, uh, I think you're, you're really in a, uh, somewhere where you're really comfortable and somewhere that you're really excited about, which is where a lot of good stuff can happen. Yeah. yeah excellent. Uh, Jeff, go ahead, Sultan. Yeah. Can I ask what are your, it's just, prompting me to think, you know, so now we've, we've hired people, maybe hired somebody because they have good stories. Like what's the role of storytelling in the organization once people are working together? You know, I, I think it's, I, I think it's an inherent part of reflection actually, but um, I, I just wonder how, how do we create space where stories are part of, part of how we interact? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I'm not an anthropologist, but what came to mind is, um, how important storytelling has been in um, indigenous cultures from from day one, where where we didn't have all these distractions of modern life. What we had were the the voices of the elders to tell us to shape help shape our learning. So I think the the good leader is going to is going to carve out um, time to do that. There's a uh, I, I don't know if he's still operating, but um, he was called the, I think he was called the 
zillion dollar coach. He operated out of California and he had clients uh, like Steve Jobs and, and other folks. And Bill Campbell was his name. And yeah. he, he also ran a company, but he all started every meeting on Monday with asking people basically for their stories. What happened this weekend? What did you do? You know, how did, how did you feel? How did you relax? He wouldn't, he wouldn't jump in with, all right, this week, you know, we have to work towards blah, 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 blah. He wanted, he wanted that kind of storytelling environment uh, built in to the culture of what he was trying to, to manage. And I know some of some like tech companies and the creative companies, particularly, they might do things like a, a weekly stand up where everybody on the team yeah. just gets up and tells the three minute story or two minute story of what they're doing, and where they are, you know, in their work, that kind of thing. But, yeah, there's a uh, um, there's a great book that I recommend and I use in my coaching and consulting called Turn the Ship Around. And it was written by. Um, uh, L. David Marquet. He was a submarine captain. And the, the book is just a brilliant book on, on leadership. And he gets he gets to that point that that you're talking about there. Yeah. Jeff, I wonder what you think about. We were talking about hiring a little bit earlier and this whole concept of, of storytelling. And how do you think about the balance between hiring somebody that is, or, or thinking about building a team how, and building a culture really, which I think is, is what you're also do. People don't think about, this is to your point, people aren't always thinking about building a culture when they're thinking about building a team. They may be thinking about a skill gap. So that's my question is what, how, to what degree do you think about um, the importance of Hiring somebody, maybe, or bringing building a team based on people being complete versions and just having them execute on one thing, versus bringing in somebody who maybe is skilled, but also you hope that they develop. And how would you build the system around that? All right, can I give you a story? Yeah, yeah please. So, um, one of my uh, favorite educators, um, her name is uh, Deb Gustafson. And she was a principal in uh, Kansas. And she inherited a, an elementary school that had over 900 kids, which is at least twice as big as most elementary schools. It was, it was huge. And it was the most underperforming school in the district. And she was given the task of turning this around. And she had to figure out, well, what's our why? What are we about? And she didn't do kind of the typical mission statement. She wanted to, she wanted to be able to say in one sentence, this is what this school is about. And because of the nature of the kids, what she had found in talking to kids and talking to some of the faculty members is that the kids didn't believe in themselves. They didn't believe that they could become somebody. Uh, they had grown up in poverty. They had been uh, failing their entire life, and they just didn't, uh, they didn't feel right. So what, what she said is what we're going to be about here is helping these kids to believe in themselves that they can become something in life. Now, she's not talking about reading or mathematics or anything like that. She's talking about the very deep human sense of we're going to help these kids feel better about themselves. And the first thing that she did is start to hire people who loved kids. That was her chief criteria. Not that they had fancy degrees, not that they had proven teaching skills. If they didn't have proven teaching skills, she said, I'll teach them how to teach, but I can't teach you how to love kids. And what these kids needed was, was love and somebody focusing on them, somebody who was going to build a relationship with them. Well, you guys can write the ending to the story. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Completely turned this district around. Um, and the, the teachers, they, they fed on this. And many of the teachers were then hired as principals in the district to replicate um, what was going on. Yeah. So um, I, I find it critical when I, when I work with 
with with people is to get away from the standard mission statement that's up on the wall because I guarantee it's going to sound like the company right down the street or the school right down the street and it you know especially school districts have these 10 12 point plans you you need something that people can grasp on and every decision every strategic move every tactical move can be looked at relative is this going to help these kids feel better about themselves and it was just it's a it's a it's an amazing story and it's gutsy because you know she wasn't hiring people with fancy teaching uh you know credentials she was hiring people who loved kids it's almost like you need a tea table you know here's the things we can't teach here's the things we can so yeah. we're gonna hire for the things that we can't yeah and then pay attention to supporting the things that we can teach yeah yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's I I I you know you know that I'm from I'm from an education world as well, and I think that that idea of getting people, uh, you know, those I mean they're they're often referred to as soft skills or or wrongly. You know, yeah, exactly. They're, they're the, as you said, they're the skills that we hire for. But the idea that we hire people, you know, in my experience, hire people who have other interests besides the work. You know, they're, they're going to be people who are, uh, you know, exhibit curiosity. This is one of the things that Wade and I are really working with as companies is how do we how do we infuse into the coaching process? How do we infuse curiosity? Uh that the managers are curious themselves, but they're supporting curiosity and and people thinking. So how how much can I get better at what I'm doing? What are the what are the opportunities? What are the you know things that I can that I might not have been thinking about yet that I can move towards? Yep, and that starts in the interview process. Mm -hmm. You know, we often look at that that last segment as perfunctory. Do you have any questions? And most people, you know, are reluctant to 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 ask anything or haven't thought ahead of time to ask something and that that always tells me something you know about their level of of curiosity and one of the one of the things that's that that's been very very hard um i think in the world of business i think it's much better from what i'm reading than it was is this whole idea of coaching is that coaching used to be synonymous with mentoring with, which is I will tell you what I did in right. order to get success versus Zoltan, what do you what do you think's going on here? What's mm -hmm. happened with the team that blah 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 blah, right? Mm -hmm. And having having the patience to ask that question, to sit back and hear what the 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 response is going to be. It's 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 huge. And companies, I think companies live or die based on their level of curiosity. Because if they're not curious, they're going to wind up doing things the same way that they've always done them because it's comfortable and times change, life changes, and it passes them by. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jeff, one of the things that I just wrote down is um, culture turnarounds. And I'm curious what you think of doing something like this, because you wrote a book on this, if I'm remembering correctly, is how to transform cultures. Yes. Um, and the, the book came out of my experience of somebody who had worked in as somebody who had worked in education for for 40 plus years as, as both a teacher and then as a as somebody in an educational publishing environment. And what we noticed, and I certainly noticed when I was a teacher in Zoltan, I'll be interested in, in your experience here. Um, I think you mentioned earlier, Zoltan, people go to a conference, you know, they get excited about um, a, a lecturer, they get excited about a book that, you know, they read, they read a, an article or they watched a TED talk. And all of a sudden we're doing that, right? We now, we're, we're now doing whatever that person talked about. And in the book, we call it the, the shiny penny syndrome yeah. is that this thing presents itself. We're, we're jumping in. We don't even know what problem we're trying to solve, but we're jumping in to try to replicate whatever they talked about. And that thing isn't fully baked when somebody else says, we need to do this. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, I was, I was whipsawed 
by the the number of changes. And I taught in an area where we didn't have standardized testing. We didn't have curriculum restrictions or anything like that. I had a tremendous amount of freedom compared to teachers today, but still it was often the, the flavor of the month, the flower of the month or whatever you want to call it. So the book, the book weight was intended to help leaders shift from that and the, the the way you you shift from that we built we built a, a a structure into the book we call it the arc model arc which is assess ready and change it was a it's a very simple structure but a lot of times people who are approaching change they don't assess the organizational capabilities to do what it needs to do. They don't assess their team's ability to do what needs to be done. They don't assess their own ability to do what needs to be done. And they don't really assess what problem are we trying to solve here by, by changing this. So the, the book was really intended to shift um, how people think about change. It was written really in two perspectives. My One of my co-authors, uh, had worked in the educational publishing environment along with me. And she focused on organizational change. I focused on individual change. And it, those two things work in the book like a DNA molecule. And the the the, the big focus there, again, is from a, a leadership standpoint, moving away from top-down command and control decision-making when it comes to change, getting... Um, getting buy-in, getting input from people on the change, why it's necessary to do this. Uh, I, ha I, have a, I have a horrible story to tell about one of the things that I was thrown into in, in educational publishing, where one of our senior executives came up with the idea on how to completely reorganize the whole company. And he basically turned it over to me to sell it. And I had to go from building to building to building to try to sell an idea, which none of these people had any input in. And those were the people in the front lines who were working with teachers and administrators on a daily basis. And you can write the end of the story. Yeah. And I think those, I mean, this is something that Wade and I have really built um, into our approach is this. I think part of the reason that those kind of things happen is what's the what's the span of of, of data. So I mean, so if you think about, you know, from an educational background, you know, basically the way much of my education went is that you did a whole bunch of learning, and then at some point you had a midterm, and then you had a final. Or you know, educational publishing. You know, you're reading a chapter in a book, and then you have questions at the end. Well. That, that's not going to help you, you know, from what happened two weeks ago. May, maybe students aren't understanding that first paragraph in that chapter. So like if, if, a, if a teacher has data on that first paragraph, the result at the end is going to be the right result, right? It's going to, because they'll have been addressed, but I think it's partly the same in business. It's like, I'm going to make a decision based on something that I have very little uh, fine grain detail on. So like, it's, you know, the idea of looking at quarterly or semi-annual or annual performance reviews, you know, what happened a year ago is not going to help me when I think about how do I improve tomorrow? You know, so, so this idea of how do we, on whatever we're doing, how do we build the conversation so that it, it's really timely, it's really granular in some ways, um, so that we're we understand what's going on on the ground right now, um, right? And, and and it think, does, it, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say it, it takes us back to what Jen is focusing on the the intuition, right? And uh, you know, in educational publishing, we did tons of research. We did a lot of focus groups and uh, surveys, and these were all designed. To your point, Sultan, these were all designed to create a, a body of data that we could hold up to executive leadership and say, this is why we built the program the way we did. Right. And I have another disaster story to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, like, just I want to hear the story, but I, I think what you're maybe going to be moving towards is that, like, a lot of times, I mean, in, we have a really uh, great UX designer, UI designer that, that we work with, 
And one of the things that she's challenged me on is the is the the architect of our software system is are you you, you people are telling you that they're going to do that, but are they really going to do that? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So and I, and I think that's the that's where the um, that's where the intuitive leadership is exceptionally important is because I mean and and, and it, because it's intuitive leadership that is informed by data and those two things actually they are not mutually exclusive they need to coexist because going off of d- data and making decisions like this well we the data says this we're going to do that we're going to do it blindly there's no questioning of whether or not that could be misleading in some way or you know even if the data collection i'm not trying to knock the data collection process that, that the team that your team went through but you know, oh, you these should. things happen. I mean, yeah, it sounds sounds like it, but I mean, Please like, even if those who are listening to this that are like, you know, we really do it well intentioned. It's like, yes, and there are some things to think about just in terms of applying how we view the world and starting to look at it from all angles. Yeah, that's it. That's a very good point. Um, uh, one of the one of the questions we could have been asked in hindsight was, do you trust this data? Do you trust the information that you got? And that would have stopped the room like a red light. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and, and tell me why you trust it, right? But what what executive leadership was looking for is did you do your homework? Right? Totally. As a as opposed to, all right, let's let's throw this up for a minute and 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 test it right here in this room. Let's see what you got, right? Yeah. So Anyway, live and learn. I mean, it's just, it's almost like, um, you know, it's unfortunate thing that I think we deal with as a human race is that we often have this short term focus and that doing those types of things where like, and I get it from the executive perspective saying like, hey, you know, if we don't do well and our share price suffers, I'm going to get canned. I get that. That's not great. But they also it also leads to decisions as made as a as a group and you know led by often a single person is making decisions that don't optimize for finding the real truth. It's just like no, we we have a justifiable enough excuse why we did something that I won't get in trouble, even yes. if it's wrong, which is just yeah. horrible, horrible practice. And I and I unfortunately I I noticed that happening. In a lot of places, which is one of the reasons why we started this company to help address these things right. and help people get to the truth. Ultimately, Zoltan, it goes back to your point about curiosity. Yeah, you know, if you're the if you're the curious executive, you want to help turn that soil a little bit, right? Yeah. I, I have a friend who jokingly says uh, he's an educator as well. He says. Uh, uh, Assessment is for people who don't actually talk to kids, and which is you know it's not exactly it's a bit of an extreme. You have to have assessment, but in in, in your point of the assess, um, ready and change the arc piece, like how much is that assessment coming from? Like what what kind of data is driving that assessment? And are the is leadership sitting down in a in a room with people who are carrying out the work and having those kind of conversations on a pretty regular basis. I know, you know, for big companies that it's difficult to do, but you still get really great information from that kind of, uh, that kind of work. Absolutely. And the, the art process that we outline in the book, it wasn't, you do assess and then it's over, you do ready and it's over and then you change and it's over. It was, it was those things happening and there's a great deal of overlap between them and um a lot of the a lot of the assessing i love that point about uh uh you're not talking to kids because i think we talked about this uh zoltan about john hattie's research yeah right you know the what he says the the biggest driver of success is actually sitting down with kids and saying tell me how you learned this or where you struggled you know, and that's a form of assessment. It's right. very, it's a very different form of assessment than these end of course or uh, you know end of semester high stakes assessments. But if teachers if teachers can find a way to do that, and that's certainly what Deb's team did in Kansas, you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. 
And that idea of like, what's the coach's role then? I mean, to, to me, really, the coach's role is to help people be able to think better about what's happening, what's happening, right? Not this, not to coach them, here's what you do, but to be able to say, okay, so now there's this problem. I'm, we're going to go, th- we're, we're going to together figure out a good way to think about this problem. Right. You know, I'm, I, I'm taking a, a memoir writing class now, an independent study. And it's, uh, the, the chapters are based on historical tours that I've taken because I love getting to where history happened. But my memoir teacher read it and she said, you know, the writing is fine, but where are you? Mm-hmm. Where, why are you doing this? You know, and I had to sit with that. To your point, I had to sit with that. She said, you need to dig a little bit deeper because the reader wants to see you in it, right? Yeah. 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 Then, they're, 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 go ahead. I was going to say they're, they're reading the memoir to read about Jeff. They're, and, they, and as much as they want to know about your travels and your stories about those travels, ultimately what the real interest is, 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 is the you, what's happening yeah. for you during that time. Yes. That's really interesting. Right. And am I, am I not sitting with it and reflecting per gen, you know, um, or am I hiding? Yeah. And then being able to make that decision about, you know, what are those pieces that, that, that actually let the people know that the reader know who, who I am. Right. You know, exactly. I think it's, I think it's great. Yeah. It seems to me like there is a little bit of a barrier sometimes in business around reflection. And it's something that, uh, you know, Zoltan and I have, I've known Zoltan for, um, gosh, probably almost 20 years. And we met because he was doing teacher development at the high school that I went to. Um, And that high school is a very forward thinking place. Uh, It's called High Tech Heights in San Diego, California. And it was one of the early pioneering charter schools and they had a lot of different educational philosophies that made them a very um, like a school that a lot of other places have modeled themselves on. And one of the things that I always really connected with as a student, and I, it has obviously (laughs) impacted me to this day as I've built a company around it um, is this idea that reflection is the key to growth. And that so many in our business life, I mean, it's very rare in my experience to, and and in speaking with people that have been in many different industries over a long career, I mean, and to hear that it's rare in their experience also, that it's not just me, um, as we've, you know, spoken to many kinds of, of professionals and, and consultants and career oriented people through this process of building our, of our, of our building our frameworks and building our approach to things. Why do you think that is Jeff? I think that's, it's part of the, the DNA of your, of the point you raised earlier, Wade, about short-term thinking, right? Mm -hmm. That um, because, you know, we have to show, we have to show results every quarter and, uh, Leaders are fearful that they're gonna they're uh, gonna look like they don't have the answer. Um, that people won't trust them. They don't want to look vulnerable. And again, I'm painting with a broad brush here. Yeah. I think I think there there has been some some growth in that area to show that vulnerability can be a a key strength. But it, it gets back to taking building time into your process to give to give yourself that time to reflect and. The other thing that Hattie said, Zoltan, was that the teachers who are successful take the time to ask themselves what worked here, what didn't work here, you know, not just moving to the next lesson because it's, you know, tomorrow's another day, but did I get through? And if I didn't get through, what happened? So it's, it, we really, we really have to shift that, that mindset and build in time pausing uh, per Kevin Cashman, great author is is i think a, a key to to business success to leadership growth giving yourself that time to think and reflect yeah wayne and i are big proponents of that 
the concept of you know the espoused theory of action and the enacted theory of action. So it's like, you know, this is what we say we do, and this is actually what happens. And and to be effective, effective companies pay attention to the difference. Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe they modify what they say they do based on that as they go. But it's like that, that's that, and even as you know, as a teacher or a professional or a coach, or whatever, I have my story that I tell myself that this is what I do. But then working with people, it, it's not always that, right? Uh, sometimes, sometimes I'm I'm not living up to that, or sometimes I'm doing something differently than that. And so paying attention to those differences by looking at the outcomes of it, thinking about, you know, how does what I did here line up with what I know is best? And so, right. So let me rotate the mic. Okay. How do you guys do that with with your clients? How do you get them to to take that time to reflect and to to measure all the inputs? Um, I I want to hear what Zoltan has to say, but just to throw out an idea out there is I think one of the things that we've done really well is to make a business case for reflection and to really build our system and our frameworks and our software and our ways of approaching this problem towards building a more effective business that actually is able to get more things done and to make the business case that if you are not reflecting on things you're leaving data on the table and you know we do this conversation every single week we do a topic we literally are showing you at the end of these, we will often do an exercise and show you how to do it in a spreadsheet. Like you don't need to buy anything from us. Like it's, it, we just want to help people get this stuff. If you want to use our system for it, we've specially designed it so that it captures all this in an easy way that people are just capturing it. Um, but the, the, the way that it has, I mean, the, the, the business case is like something that I think about just because I think that the paradigm of we need the results. Like I, I, I get like in my perfect world that we change that. Right. But I think that's a little bit of a ways off. Mm -hmm. So I th try to think about it in the way of how can we talk about it in that context? Because I don't want to tell the executive, you shouldn't be worrying about that because that's, that's invalidating their concern. And I don't, that's not a, productive ground for us to go off of, but almost to say, we get it. And there's a way that you can do this. We've, we've, we've come up with a way that you can do this, that will enable you to access this reflective capacity in, in a way that empowers you to improve your results. Yeah. Which and, I think, and I think Wade has done a really great job of creating this uh, data collection device, but it's really based around a couple of things. So I, I think one of the aspects of reflection is that there has to be clarity on what you're shooting for. Yeah. You know, even if you don't know how to Absolutely. get there, you you have to you have to be aligned. Like the you know, I have to be aligned with my coach or mentor, my manager, or whatever, in where we're going, where we're intending to go. That person has to be aligned with the leadership in terms of where we're intending to go, and I, I think. So building that clarity is number one of, of we're all in agreement that this is what we're saying uh, we're we're shooting for. And then the second thing is like, so what's, you know, where, where are we falling short? And that comes into that curiosity piece. So we actually have created and we, we work with companies using what we call an inquiry based uh, mentoring or coaching protocol, which is not, it, it's, we talk about um, the metaphor of solving a puzzle together. So, you know, if I, if I'm if Wade's coaching me, and we're working on a puzzle, we know where we're going because we can see the picture on the box, right? Right. But I have some I have some expertise as the employee. Wade has some expertise in building the puzzle, right? Not in, but but there there are different aspects to that. There's different ways of approaching it. There's different ways of doing it. And so how do, how can we create every in every O3 or every you know coaching model or whatever it is that you have this way of uh, putting on the table where we're going and then puzzling 
around the ideas of like what's what's working, what's not working, right? What things that what are the resources that we need? What are, you know is do, do I need to develop more skill? Do I need more resources? Do I need more time? Yep. Um, those so then you're looking at all the factors and trying to say okay, so now for this week we're going to try this. Um, but it's based on knowledge of where we're going. It's based on not somebody coming and saying, do it this way, but really trying to sort out the problem and figure out, you know, to me, the, the idea of having that clarity levels the playing. I, I don't think it works very well. I don't think it actually works very well in a classroom to have a person standing up there saying, this is the way, this is what you should think. This is the way it should be done. That's, you know, it, it first of all, it, it doesn't connect to the meaning for somebody. It doesn't connect to where they are. Uh, right, right. So what, how can we, how can we pull both people? The person being coached is the more important voice in that conversation than yeah, the right. coach. So that, I do this, I do this uh, exercise in my coaching to your point, Zoltan, about knowing where you're going. Mm -hmm. And I, I pose the question to clients. I say, picture, picture two, two images in your head, a rowboat mm -hmm. or a canoe. Right. Are you sitting in a rowboat or are you sitting in a canoe? Right. And, you know, people will pause and I say, if you're sitting in a rowboat, which way are you facing to power the boat? Mm -hmm. If you're sitting in a canoe, which way are you facing to power the canoe? Right. And we we eventually get to the point that if you're in a rowboat, you're sitting basically backwards. You can't see where you're going. You constantly have to turn around. But what you're facing is the past. Right. You're facing where you came from. If you're in a canoe, you're able to look ahead at the point that you're trying to reach on the horizon. And because a lot of times we're making decisions, well, we, you know, this, this is the way we, we've been doing it, right? Or this, this is how we did it in the past, you know, as opposed to your, your point about evaluating, well, what do we need to take? What do we need to do to go forward? And, and even if you know, you know, and this is, this is well, our big push on how do we collect the data? How do we collect the data in those, you know, very closely spaced opportunities uh, with people you know yeah. maybe what we say where we're headed is not the right thing you know so you know how many companies say this is what we're doing this is this is what we're calling effective work or effective skill but it's not the right one you know and and, and they don't have the feedback they don't have the ongoing sort of inputs just to, to make that decision that this isn't the right this isn't the right direction here exactly yeah so, or we're off, we're off target. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. goodness. We could yeah. talk about this for another couple hours, I think. Absolutely. And 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 fortunately we will get the chance on on Jeff's show coming up. But yeah. um yeah, this has been uh such a wonderful conversation that I am regrettably uh, just looking up at our timer here and noticing that we have a, only a few minutes to go, which is time flies when you're having fun is one of the most true things I think. Um Absolutely. But um, yeah, I mean, to 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 we didn't even get to talk about Jeff's Jeff's coaching with people, and there's so much else going on here. But um, Jeff, any any closing thoughts that you, things that you hope to impress upon people when you when you connect with people that maybe is your thing that you want? If there was one thing to leave people with, what would you think? Well, yeah, you, know, you, you use the operative word, and it's people, and that may sound tired and cliche to some to some folks but i i really think that when we run into obstacles in organizations the obstacles are the the silos that we have created the fiefdoms that we have created that people have created and they're not necessarily obstacles of of resources it's how how are we getting along how are we working together as a team what language do we use to describe how we get along and how we function and as a, as a leader can i show can i show vulnerability that will help then empower my staff to contribute ideas that they might not otherwise do because they're waiting for me to have all the answers so 
Um, I don't know. It's it sounds to me, and I'm I'm really looking forward, guys, to when when we rotate the mic again and you yeah. and yeah. I'm getting unstuck. I'm really looking forward to to knowing more about the work that you're doing and how clients are responding um, to that work because it's um, it's it's critical stuff. You know, there's there's a lot at stake for a lot of organizations. Obviously, they got big numbers to hit or big deliverables to hit, and um, we often get in our own way. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, Jeff. Yep. Jeff, where can people find you online just to um, so we can link to something and anybody that's watching this can can find it too? Yeah, so my website is queticocoaching.com. Q-U-E-T-I-C-O, queticocoaching.com. And um, my my podcasts are there. Description of the coaching is there. Uh, there's an assessment there about uh, that would help in the interview process. So it's a pretty rich site. So that's where they can they can go. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Jeff. And we will link all of this stuff once again. Everybody, this is Jeff Eichler joining us. You can also look for just search his name on the Apple Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. I have been listening to a couple of episodes recently. Oh my gosh. I cannot believe that this is not one of the most talked about podcasts out there, Jeff. Just recognizing you for the guests that you've had on. I was like, I got to call Zoltan. We got to bring our A game to this yeah. podcast. <laughs> We're going to be with some great. We're among great companies. So uh, Jeff, just thank you so much for being here. This has been a super, super enlightening conversation. And uh, we are just very grateful to have you. Yeah, back at you guys. I, I, I'm, I'm glad our our paths crossed, and I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. Yeah. Likewise, Jeff, and Absolutely. thanks to everybody listening as well. Thanks, everyone. Mm-hmm.